This is Greg Locke. If you're unfamiliar, let me introduce you to the guy. He's a famous hate preacher, megachurch pastor, talks about hating gay people and atheists and just anybody that you can name, he hates them, right? Well, he comes out there the other day and he says this about Democrats. Listen to this. I'm to the place right now, if you vote Democrat, I don't even want you around this church. You can get out. You can get out, you demon. You can get out, you baby butchering election thief. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. I don't care how mad that makes you. You get pissed off as you want to. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. They are God-denying demons that butcher babies and hate this nation. So anyway, that's Greg Locke. I know that's a lot to drop on you. Well, as it turns out, the dude wrote a book. The book's name is this means war, we will not surrender through silence. Now, I've been reading through this book. This is part four. If you haven't seen the other parts, don't sweat it. You don't have to see the others to understand what's happening here. This stands independently of the rest. But we just finished the last chapter, which I believe was chapter 13. We're starting on part four, proclamation. Part one was prophecy, part two was persecution, part three was preparation, and then part four was proclamation. He really likes his alliterations. Honestly, all four parts are really about persecution. That's what his whole life revolves around, how persecuted the guy is. So anyway, let's read part four. If this is your first time here watching one of these Telltale Read segments, sometimes he has these long Bible verses here, like this one is Matthew 10, 26 to 34. I do read them because it adds context, but I read them from my own Bible, which is an NIV, because he does the King James, and in my opinion, King James Version is terrible. It's objectively a worse translation in many ways, and the NIV is also human readable, and that makes it even better. So anyway, this one was Matthew 10, 26 to 34. Let's just read it, and you guys can follow along on screen in King James if you want to. It's in red, so it means Jesus was reading, was speaking this. So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them... Wait, did pennies exist back then? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered, so don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn man against his father and daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. So basically the, the whole point in this, it sounds to me, is Greg Locke is trying to point out that God says you shouldn't be afraid of people. You should be afraid of, like, Satan rather than people, people who can, or beings who can destroy your immortal soul. And I notice he also included that very last verse about not sending peace but a sword. Christians use this verse right here, 1034, to justify violence uh, pretty often. So when, anytime I see, you know, a Christian, particularly one of the hate preachers I cover, talk about that verse, Matthew 10, 34, I realize they're probably about to justify violence. So let's see what Greg Locke does with it, shall we? Speak now or forever hold your peace is the name of this chapter, number 14. There's a passage that's been on my heart for much of 2020, and I've long known it would become a central theme of this book. I have to admit that maybe my personal fears and insecurities have given me pause before applying this passage to the here and now, but I believe it speaks directly to where we are all living as the church, not just our local church, but the big C church, the body of Christ in America, in the culture and around the world. We're going to take another look into the life and scripture of the prophet Ezekiel from the Old Testament, and I'm going to share my heart with you a bit and just chit chat with you a little while longer as we approach the end of this book. If you weren't here for the other parts, this book is very much just a constant stream of nonsense. Pretty poorly edited. He uses incorrect words frequently. 
like mixing up words like infer and imply that seems like something the editor should have caught right did he even work with an editor i don't know the whole book is just nonsensical from beginning to end honestly okay well let's keep reading I also want to open up some topics that I'm working through and living through as a Christian and a pastor that we, the church, are all walking through together. Whether you live across the street from us at Global Vision or across the state of Tennessee or live many states away or even somewhere else around the globe, I want you to know that we consider all of you to be part of the family. Yeah, I hear the same thing from cult leaders. I'm just saying. I, not that that tells me that this is a cult or not. I'm just saying I hear it a lot. Doesn't matter if you've only vis visited us one time or never before. If you're a believer, you're a part of the family. I'm grateful you found your way to this book and hope you found the opportunity to hear the gospel as we preach it every week, live and streaming online all week long. He is entirely too wordy. He is more wordy than he needs to be. Did he really need to draw this out to be a paragraph long, this whole thing? Especially if you don't currently have a church that you can attend live and in person. Yeah, this was released during the pandemic. That's why he said that. Our online sermons carry the same biblical truth, transparent honesty, and Holy Spirit guidance found in this book, plus all the passion you'd expect from a revival tent packed with worshipers. He misspelled worshipers. Once again, what was the editor doing here? Look, I double-click it to define no results in English in the, dic in the English U.S. dictionary. It's misspelled. It's not a word. It has one P. Not two. It's P, not PP. So, <laughs> whoever edited this book is a piss poor editor and should be fired. Seriously. Nothing beats a live gathering, but at least you can still get the living word online for now. So, he, I guess by saying that, he believes that the government forced him to shut down his church, although he refused and faced no consequences. How about that? And. He thinks that the government is also going to force churches to stop preaching online. He lives in a delusional reality. Honestly, he really does. Next subheading is opening prayer. He has a tendency to do opening prayers and closing prayers in each chapter. They're roughly the same, give or take, but it's definitely a good way of filling space. He fills space constantly in this book. Anyway, point is... Greg Locke does an opening and closing prayer in each section, in each chapter, honestly, and it's usually just nonsense, the exact same thing repeated over and over, so let's give it a read. Opening prayer. As we dive into part four, please speak this prayer with me. Father, I know that there are people reading this book for a hundred different reasons. Mine are nefarious, I would say, to make fun of it primarily. Is that nefarious? I don't know. You be the judge. But at the end of the day, we're reading because we want to hear from you, and we want to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, I know all is in vain unless the... Wait, all is vain. I'm sorry. I know all is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One comes down. I thought the saying was in vain, not vain. So I pray that you would make this message about Jesus. You know, if I saw this in any other book, I would assume that I was incorrect, that it, it this was correct usage. All is vain unless the spirit blah, blah, blah. But I'm reading from Greg Locke's book, and I've seen so many errors in this book already that I, I'm, I'm not sure if it's right or not. Somebody let me know in the comments if that's a correct usage of the phrase or not. So I pray that you would make this message about Jesus and that you'd make this book about the authority of the Bible, the power of the Holy Spirit, and your love and forgiveness, Father. So Lord, give us boldness, give us courage, give us biblical soundness, and give all readers of this book the ears to hear what you say through all we read. When he says boldness and courage and bi biblical soundness what he means is everybody who reads this book should be directly contradicting the government and biblical principles just because just for the hell of it no other reason than that i.e don't shut down your church even though the bible says where two or more people meet god is with them so you could meet 10 people in a group you could split your church into groups of 10 and still be within biblical law and legal and the u.s legal system simultaneously when he says give us boldness give us courage and biblical soundness what he means is encourage people to contradict the bible and the legal system that's really what he means we'll get there we're going to be careful to give you the honor and the glory and praise due to your glorious name jesus so it is in your name that we pray amen the lord speaks in mysterious ways is the name of this subheading 
As I shared in part one when I first began to speak about my blue flame dream during our live services. Yeah, let, let me give you a little bit of background because he did talk about a blue flame dream. He does not claim to be a prophet of God, okay? But he does claim to receive prophecy from God. I don't know what the difference is being a prophet and receiving prophecy, but either way, he claims to have received a prophetic dream from God where he was having a dream where he's in his church, and the people are outside the door of the church, even though he's in a circus tent, not in a building. And the government turned off the lights in his church, like the electricity. Again, even though he's in a tent and not an actual building that has electrical lines run to it, I don't know, maybe he has electricity run into the, the tent, who knows. And he's crying and screaming about the fact that the government turned off his lights because he wasn't supposed to be holding church service because there was a raging pandemic going on. And he was yelling to the people outside the door. I mean, this is all fabricated. This is from his head. This is not real life. By the way, this did not happen. His lights stayed on. He continued meeting throughout the course of the pandemic. This is just some persecution dream that he had. So he's yelling to the people outside the tent or whatever to not go away because he's getting the lights turned back on soon. And then he let all the people in and the lights turned back on and blue flames all lit up ab above people's heads. So he was looking around and everyone in the congregation had a blue flame lit above their head. And he believes that's a prophetic dream that says they're going to be persecuted terribly and that's going to make them believe it even harder, basically. That was his prophetic dream, though he's not a prophet. So that's what he's talking about when he says the blue flame dream. When I first began to speak about my blue flame dream during our live services, I also talked about all the confirmations that have been pouring in. Suddenly, there was a deluge of folks who felt the Lord wanted them to share what he'd put on their hearts. Whether they reached me by phone or by approaching me at a revival meeting or by flying into Tennessee for a single Wednesday night service, each dropped the same nugget of truth in our spirit, and in each case, these confirmations were virtually verbatim. In unprecedented fashion, I was hearing the exact same message that someone else had already told us and that someone else had already written to us and that someone else had already called to tell us. My God, did he really have to say someone else three different times? He couldn't have structured that sentence to be a little bit shorter. These confirmations continue to this day. As the Lord first began to show up through these people with such startling alignment, I remained careful to whom and what degree I shared the details of this unified message. I wanted everything that I do to be to the glory of God through the power of the Holy Spirit and nothing more. I want to honor and exalt the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ, and I want to know it's always the Spirit of God talking, not the people. That's really interesting because there are a couple of instances where Greg Locke prophesied from God that this thing or that thing, or he believed this was going to happen, and it did not come to pass, which, of course, you know, means it was not from God. And the Bible has a very specific prescription for when that happens. Not saying I condone that. I absolutely do not. I'm just saying he should at the very least lose his church for that stuff. At one point, we had a meeting scheduled for nearly a month with folks who originally reached out to me on Twitter, and I almost had to reschedule it, but something compelled me to make it happen as originally scheduled. So they flew in from Colorado Springs for a single sit-down meeting at Olive Garden, and I made sure not to say Jack Spratt about any of the confirmations my wife and I had been receiving during the preceding months before first hearing what they had to say. Why does he say Jack Spratt? I, it, it just drives me nuts when he uses really stupid, annoying sayings like this. Spratt is not in the dictionary. Once again, I have no idea what that word means. So I, what he's saying here, I guess, is he met some people on Twitter and they set up a meeting at an olive garden and they show up and he didn't say anything about the confirmations that he and his wife had been receiving during the preceding months. And the confirmations that he's talking about here, I, I'm just trying to catch up and make sure that I understand what he's trying to communicate. The, when he says confirmations, he's saying he's hearing the exact same message. What message? I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. Like, I feel like I, I'm sifting through this whole par like subheading, and I'm having a lot of trouble understanding what he's trying to communicate. So he says, some people contact him on Twitter, 
and he decided not to tell them about the confirmations that they'd been hearing during throughout the preceding months or whatever. What confirmations is he talking about? He's mentioned the confirmations a couple times, and at the start of the subheading, he says, suddenly there's a deluge of folks who felt the Lord wanted them to share what he'd put on their hearts. What did he put on their hearts? What's he talking about? He hasn't even told us what these confirmations are about. I have no idea what he's talking about currently. I feel like this is a poorly written book. Anyway, so the last sentence was he he decided not to tell them Jack Spratt about any of the confirmations he'd received. Lo and behold, once they shared what they came to share, I got emotional. I can get emotional every now and then, but not often over spaghetti. Oh, he gets emotional constantly, which nothing wrong with that. That's great, you know? The idea that crying is wrong is very much a product of toxic masculinity and should be done away with, but he gets emotional over ridiculous things. Like how much he loves Jesus and stuff. I'm sorry. It's just too much, man. I can get emotional every now and then, but not often over spaghetti. And there I was getting choked up just thinking about the fact that God sent two more people to tell us things they had no way of knowing unless the Spirit revealed it to them. Again, he hasn't told us what these things are. What's he talking about? These, these things that they have no way of knowing. What? Issues no one knew we had been praying about. Nobody else knew the context of any of these things, yet they were able to speak them plainly as if they were just reading it off a page. When the Spirit of God is moving through people and telling them to speak into you, as long as it doesn't contradict the truth and the authority of this book, I've come to a place where I'm going to receive it and stand on it. Okay, interesting. So, Greg Locke started out Baptist. I don't know if you guys were aware. And eventually, he filed his business license in 2006. He eventually moved away from the Baptist denomination, beliefs, theology, whatever, and now identifies as non-denominational. And we can see this shift happening. I've been watching him for years, and I'm watching this shift take place. He stopped identifying as Baptist, started identifying as non-denominational. He started doing exorcisms a lot more, constantly. He started claiming that he's capable of doing hexes and divination and fortune telling, but his power comes from Jesus rather than from Satan, or from Satan, as he believes that witches get their power. He started worshiping Trump as a pseudo deity, basically, as like a, a messiah. And now he's telling us in this book he wasn't always he didn't always believe in prophecy. But now he believes that people can be prophetic. And he says, as long as it doesn't contradict the truth and the authority of the Bible, I've come to the place where I'm going to receive it and stand on it. So if somebody tells him that they receive prophecy from God, as long as it doesn't contradict the Bible, he buys it. There are some real wacky prophets out there, man. Real wacky ones. People like Julie Green, for example. Oh, my God. Let me show you an example of a prophet from the Trump cult. From the Witches for Jesus, like, evangelical cult. Julie Green works with the Doug Mastriano campaign. She's an official campaign prophet. This is her on screen, if you're watching. She prophesies about political figures all the time. This is information that came from God and is being passed down to Julie Green to be given to ministers, to pass to, the organi- or to, pass to their congregants and to the government. Listen to what Julie Green says here. They know Nancy can't handle the presidency. Nancy Pelosi. No. They know she's a drunk. First of all, who's they? And second, how do you know that? Is God? Are you telling me that God told you this? But they know she is dying. And they helped with that. They are now disposing of anyone they feel is no longer useful to them. When she says they, she's talking about the cabal or the... Illuminati or the deep state or whatever you want to call them. The organization who runs things behind the scenes secretly when you're not watching and pulling all the strings and getting people elected and choosing leaders and all that stuff. That's who she's talking about. It's just conspiracy theory after conspiracy theory. She fell the puppet masters with her two impeachments. That didn't work. No, no assignment and anything they gave her against Trump, it didn't work. So now she is seen as a failure. Her days are coming to an end and she will not last until the 2020 midterm elections. 
So Julie Green is claiming that Nancy Pelosi failed the Illuminati, the deep state, the cabal. And they're so upset by that that they're going to kill her out of retaliation for failing to impeach Trump. And they're, and it's going to happen before the midterms. Time's ticking. This is called a false prophecy, or it will be in the next, I don't know, week or two. I mean, midterms are right around the corner. She'll be visited by the angel of death for her crimes against my nation. And the blood is dripping from her hands. She loves to drink the little children's blood. By drinking this blood, they believe they will receive a longer life. Completely delusional stuff in every way. So that's Julie Green, and that's the type of prophecy that's a type of belief that greg Locke holds that that's QAnon stuff and greg Locke is a QAnoner. so anyway let's keep reading see what else he has to say this is him announcing basically that he accepts that prophecy is out there now and he believes that people who prophesy are really are prophesying as long as it doesn't contradict the bible which what we just heard doesn't technically contradict the Bible because it doesn't say anything about Nancy Pelosi drinking children's blood because it's nonsense. It was never in there in the first place. Anyway, let's read on and see what kind of nonsense Greg Locke has for us now. So there we were in Olive Garden at Providence Mall in Mount Juliet, small town USA, and I cried like a baby. I couldn't stop thinking God is doing what God has always promised that he was going to do, and he's doing it right here. He's opening doors we could never imagine, and he used this overwhelming outpouring of encouragement and confirmation to ensure I close this book with another message God wrote to us through Ezekiel more than 2,500 years ago. So I, am I to take it that he's about to prophesy again about some, some nonsense? I mean, his, his blue flame dream was nonsense. It was not a prophecy. It was simply a dream. But what other prophecy could he have to give us here? Getting in God's way is this subheading. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said that we ought to pray for God to open doors that no man can shut and to shut doors that no man can open. By now, you might have already figured this out about me and our people at Global Vision. If God opens a door, we're going to run through it. Okay. If God shuts a door, we aren't kicking it in, and we aren't knocking on it in an effort to get back in. We're just going to turn around and start going in the other direction. Well, here's my question. How does Greg know that God closed the door? I mean, w I'm not even sure what context he could possibly mean this in, but how does he know that Satan didn't close the door? How does he know that Satan isn't offering opposition? This is the perfect excuse for anything. If something happens that Greg doesn't like... He claims it's Satan getting in his way. If something happens that Greg does like, he claims that God is endorsing it and trying to help him get it or whatever else. He's found a perfect way to validate his faith and still get what he wants at any cost. It's insane. I want to be like the servant of Abraham who said, I being in the way the Lord led me. Okay. I just want to get in God's way where he wants me to be. I just want God to lead us and guide us, and I know he's going to do that through the context of his word, no matter how many saints he sends to alert us. In Ezekiel 33, there's an urgent message to the Church of Jesus Christ in the United States of America, and it applies directly to where we are today. There's an urgent message in the book of Ezekiel for the U.S. Church? For the church in the United States. Okay... If you can't see that we're in desperate need of revival, you couldn't have read the previous three sections of this book. These are those days, and it's time. I'm not just saying this because churches are closing down, some permanently. And I'm not just saying this because of the mandates and darkness we covered in the first three parts of this book. Okay, there were never any vaccine mandates, first of all. It's not a mandate if you have a way out. And people had the choice of either getting vaccinated or being tested every week. That's not a mandate. You had the choice of not getting vaccinated if you wanted and keeping your job. And besides that, the Supreme Court struck the mandate, as you'd call it, down anyways. And second, there were never any shutdowns. There was not a federal shutdown. There were state-by-state -state shutdowns, which, gr which Greg Locke refused to comply with, but there was never a federal lockdown. Greg Locke's church never shut down at any point. All they were asking was for him to hold services outside, wear masks and social distance, 
or hold services online. One of those three options. And he wouldn't even do the most basic of it. He wouldn't do the, the most basic precautions to protect people's lives. Do you know what he did? Instead of encouraging people to wear masks, he said, if you show up and try to make us wear masks or try to shut us down or hold services online or outside, we are going to pull our guns out and we're going to shoot you. That's what he said. He said it multiple times, not just once. Since they're trying to shut us down, they need to know that we are both biblical and constitutional. So I said, we so believe in our First Amendment right to gather that if you show up and you impede on our First Amendment right to worship, we gonna meet you at the door with our Second Amendment right because we are not closing our church because the government told us to. See, no one ever asked him to close his church. They asked him to hold services outside or wear masks or social distance or whatever, anything at all. But in Greg's mind, that translated to they're trying to shut us down permanently and we need to pull the guns out and do something about it. Before we watch this one, I just want to preface it by saying he is on YouTube and Twitter and every other social media network still currently. Again, they did kick him off. But he's on them again, and he's got 100,000 plus subbies on YouTube now. This conservative censorship is true across the board. I've been banned from you know, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook has banned me, put me in jail many, many times. I'm sure you and your program, being as bold as it is, you've experienced the exact same thing. It's, it's not about being conservative. It's about being an extremist who calls for violence on the regular. People that say that this is not an attack have lost their mind. This is an absolute attack on our First Amendment right. And I tell people all the time, look, when it comes to our church and what we need to say and remaining open, that uh, when they impede upon our First Amendment right, we'll meet them at the door of the tent with our Second Amendment right. Because, look, they are trying to silence us. And I think our compromise is our silence. The fact that we are not willing to push back. So anyway, he said it multiple times. That's Those aren't even the only two examples that I have on my computer right now. I have a lot more examples of him saying that he intends to shoot anybody who tries to, anybody who asks him to hold services outside or be careful about this thing or that thing or whatever else. It's insane. I'm not just saying this because churches are closing down, some permanently, and I'm not just saying this because of the mandates and darkness we covered in the first three parts of this book. I'm talking about the tragic reality that the church in America isn't just shrinking into silence, it's actually fallen fast asleep. We are watching biblical prophecy being fulfilled in context every single week before our very eyes, and it's almost like churches are just sitting there numb, and pastors are just standing there in a daze, and no one is catching the vision or getting excited about what they're seeing unfold. Most everybody is discouraged about the violence in the news but I'm actually encouraged because God said it was going to have to happen so I guess he believed that we were in the end times we were in the last like five minutes or whatever of of the end of days before Armageddon happens uh, this book was released October 2020 and it was written around July or August 2020 so yeah couple years now I guess <laughs> couple years have passed and uh, it's still not happened. I wonder how he feels about that one. We already know that in the last days, extreme wickedness and evil would come and that men would be lovers of themselves. No matter how you slice it, these are those days so I don't get discouraged. I'm not going to walk around with my lip dragging gr the ground. What? Lip dragging the ground. What does that mean? Or be like, oh my goodness, I've got to go to church again. I can't believe I've got to get up and grab that microphone and go under that hot tent to preach again. He is always complaining about how hot the church is, the tent, because he holds services in a tent instead of an actual building. Why doesn't he just get fans or air conditioners or whatever? Or, or hell, the guy is a millionaire, certainly. Why doesn't he just buy a building? Not long ago, he donated like $100,000 to this guy, uh, Ken Peters, to build something called Patriot Church. I thought I had a, a copy of a Facebook post that, that basically talked about Greg Locke donating like 100 grand to Ken Peters' Patriot Church to get a new church campus or whatever. But I, yeah, I don't know where the, the Facebook post is. But Greg Locke has 
massive amounts of money lying around, like hundreds of thousands of dollars sitting in the bank that he could just do whatever with. Insane money. You know, I don't know why he continues to complain about how hot it is. Just get a normal building. I can hardly wait to gather with the people of God. I wish we had church at six o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I like my job too, you know? I like sitting here and talking to people and all that good stuff. It's entertaining. It's fun. I like doing it. It's a good job to do. The editing can be difficult, you know? I, I spend a disproportionate amount of time editing videos and stuff, and that, that kind of sucks, but uh, I love streaming and stuff. I could do this all day long. So, yeah, I'm on the same page. They prayed for these days is the next subheading. We are watching the Bible being fulfilled in ways that those who come before us could only dream of, literally, so I can hardly sit still. The generation that we're living in is the very generation that the New Testament church has always prayed would be theirs, but wasn't. It sounds like Greg Locke believes that the end is imminent, that it's happening immediately, that it's coming any five minutes now. And I was told that when I was little, but you know, looking at it in the cold light of day, just taking a step back and really thinking about it, it's been... 2,000 plus years, right? When are people going to accept that it is deeply arrogant to believe that the end is coming in your lifetime? You're special. It's coming because you're here and you get to experience it. Get over yourself. People have been waiting for it for 2,000 years. Didn't happen then. It's not happening now. What makes you think it'll come anytime in the next 500 years or 1,000 years? It is the height of hubris to think the end is coming now. They prayed for what we were being given. They also prayed for spiritual persecution to come against the church because they knew the church never grows in comfort and only grows in persecution and affliction. And that's why Greg Locke constantly talks about how persecuted he is, despite the fact that he's not persecuted at all. He's one of the most privileged demographics in human history. He's a white Christian American male. He has all the power in this country. And he claims to be persecuted. Why? Because the church grows when it feels like it's being persecuted. That's why. And he's, just, he's admitting it right here. We are living in the days that, that the Apostle Paul could only dream of. We are living in the days that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John could only hope for. These saints prayed for their return of the Lord and coming of his kingdom soon. Though Jesus said they wouldn't see it, he confirmed there was a generation that would see it all come to pass. Imagine how every generation since has prayed he was talking about them. Now here we are. Seriously, the height of hubris to claim that the end is here right now and that you're the one that gets to experience it. We're living in a generation where in just six months we've left 50 years in the prophetic timeline of the Bible, and I think it's just getting geared up. I think it's just now starting. But if you can't see it, it's because you don't want to see it. It's because you refuse to see it. And the church is walking around with blinders on, not paying attention to the truth of the word of God, because what God said was going to happen is finally happening right before our eyes. This guy completely lives in a delusion. He cannot grapple with the fact that he's completely full of it. And it is the height of arrogance to believe that you're the generation that gets to experience the apocalypse. You're the one that gets to experience this. R ridiculous. From the ground up. Speak now is the name of this subheading. Being a pastor, it's an occupational hazard for me to have a lot of different ceremonies to officiate. Funerals and weddings, for example. Of all the weddings that I've performed or been a part of, there's something that the old-time preachers used to say that I think is sorely missing these days. It's rarely ever said in modern church weddings, and probably for good reason. But you old-timers, I say that respectfully, will remember when the preacher would be all suited and booted like a third person on a wedding cake, and the bride and the groom would nervously stand in front of a house full of folks who were all also dressed up. They would go through all the I do's and all the I don'ts and the vows and the kissing and the exchanging of rings and throwing bird seed at people and all of those fun things. Okay. Are you going to get to the point, what thing do you believe that you're in danger of doing or, or being attacked for or whatever? Then there was that one not so fun thing that always had everyone holding their breath, especially the bride and groom. Before the pastor or officiant would say, I now pronounce you husband and wife, and Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so perform their big, wet, sloppy kiss in front of everybody and embarrass themselves forevermore on camera. You're not supposed to do a big, wet, sloppy kiss. You're just supposed to, like, you're not supposed to make out with somebody. You're just supposed to kiss. <laughs> what is he talking about here? God, it's, 
just ridiculous from beginning to end. Like his entire personality that he's portraying in this book, I, in my opinion, is intended to make him seem like an everyman, like Joe the plumber, you know, like just a regular guy making jokes about all, whatever, you know, that, that big wet sloppy kiss and they embarrass themselves on camera. You're like a ham sandwich in a synagogue. You're so short that you could sit on a dime and your legs would dangle. You know, he, he's desperate, desperate to make people think that he's just like them, despite being a multimillionaire, of course. Anyway, let's keep reading here. The old time preachers would say, if there's anybody up in the house that has a just cause for this couple not to come together, again, there's probably a very good reason we don't ask that these days. If there's any reason that these two should not be divinely brought together in holy matrimony, speak now or forever hold your peace. Yeah, the I, I believe, somebody correct me in the comments, I think the reason that they used to do this was in case the person was already married or in case they were related to the person and they didn't know it or some other thing like that. We didn't have as good of record keeping 200 years ago as we have today, especially with the advent of the internet. So it was a lot more necessary to do the speak now or forever hold your peace bit. It's a lot less important nowadays. Uh, that's my understanding of it. That's correct. Okay, that's what I was, that's what I assumed. So Greg Locke, I guess, when writing this book, w didn't know the reason. You would think that being a book, he would do a little bit of research into this stuff and wouldn't imply that he had no idea why this was or, or, or whatever. It's just odd. Why not just look it up? You have the electric Google machine at your fingertips. No need to wonder. Just loaded up our question gun. Let's go answer hunting. I don't understand. They'd be like, look, if you're going to say it, you'd better say it right now before we hitch these two together. If you're ever going to put it out there, you'd better do it right now. If you're ever going to spill the beans, you better kick the bucket over right here and right now. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, I, I don't... What was the point of all that, okay? So the, the subheading started out, being a pastor, it's an occupational hazard for me to have a lot of different ceremonies to officiate funerals and weddings. Of all the weddings that I've performed or been a part of, there's something that preachers used to say. And then he finally gets to the point, the thing that preachers used to say is, speak now or forever, hold your peace. And that was an occupational hazard for him? Why? What, what, what is he even talking about? And now it's the end of the subheading? Were you ever going to tell us like why this is an occupational hazard or what this has to do with Jesus or the rest of the book or whatever? Or are you just going to leave that hanging in the air? The next subheading is history repeats itself. Is he going to explain it in this one? It The answer belonged in the previous subheading. So if he explains it in this one, it's a terrible book. I mean, it's a terrible book anyways. I've found like multiple grammatical errors all through this thing, but that's neither here nor there. History repeats itself. I believe that God Almighty is saying this right now to the church in the United States and around the world. If you're going to speak, you'd better speak now. If you're going to preach, you'd better preach now. If you're going to pray, you'd better pray now. If you're going to fast, you better fast now. Oh my God, okay. If you're going to believe in God for miracles, you better believe in God for miracles now. Speak now or forever hold your peace, church. He is so wordy with this stuff. It drives me nuts, dude. When discussing speaking out, I often hear people say things like, well, you know, if I was alive back in the days of Nazi Germany, I believe I would have said something. I believe I would have made a phone call. I believe I would have turned them in. I would have stood up to it. I would have stood out. I would have dot, dot, dot. What would you have done? Before you answer, let me tell you the truth. Whatever you think you would have been doing then is exactly what you aren't doing right now. In reality, Greg Locke and his congregants are morally and politically aligned with Nazis in Nazi Germany, more morally and politically aligned with them than with the people on the other side of the fence in Germany at the time, like by far. Now, there is a line that... Hitler crossed eventually. Hitler was moving Jews into ghettos and mistreating them and ostracizing them from the rest of society for a long time leading up to what happened. He found reasons for society to hate the Jewish people. And there came a time when Jewish, the Jewish people were really sick of what was happening being mistreated and everything. And one guy, one person assassinated a German dignitary or, or ambassador of some sort from another country. I forget where exactly or who it was, but 
Hitler used that attack, that assassination, as a pretext to start what he called the Jew hunt. He started saying, anybody that you find outside of these areas, you need to take them out. And eventually it turned into find them and take them out. Find them and kill them. That is just plain and simple. That was when the violence really fully started uh, officially. And it came to the point where he realized that no matter how much these people hate Jews or whoever else, hate black people in the case of America or gay people or whoever it happens to be, no matter how much they hate them, humans are not supposed to kill other humans. It deeply affects our psychology negatively. Even people that really had a problem with the Jewish community and believed that they were part of this big cabal that was running the big banks and all that stuff, which is the pretext that Hitler used to make people hate the Jews, blame them for all of their problems, right? No matter how much you hate them, you're not supposed to kill another human. It's against our psychology. It's against who we are as human beings. And it was giving people PTSD, who were doing this, despite the fact that they agreed with what they were doing, their brains could not handle what they were doing. So Hitler came up with this plan to basically pull people out and stop them from doing what they called the Jew hunt and have them just arrest Jewish people from then on. Instead of doing the hard work themselves, they had them arrest the people and send them to a central area where they were taking them out en masse that's when the the holocaust started in full now we can look at timelines of events along the way right like 1930s early 30s hitler came to power and all through that time he was demonizing the jewish people blaming them for all of the problems shuttling them to the ghettos and ordering them not to leave and attacking them and, you know, all of it. Hitler was saying the exact same things about the Jews that Donald Trump and Greg Locke and all of these other far-right extremist pastors and figures say about immigrants, about the black community, about the gay community. Let me just give you one simple, straightforward example. This is Tommy McMurtry. He's a member of the NIFB, the New Independent Fundamentalist Baptist Church, started by Stephen Anderson, Pastor Stephen Anderson. I've talked about him a few times. This guy is a pastor of one of the NIFB churches. Greg Locke agrees with this position, and I have some videos to back that up that Greg Locke agrees with this position. I can only play certain ones on YouTube. I can't play all of it because it's too on the nose and bad. But listen to what Tommy says here. We know there have always been, we know they have always been around. We've read the book of Genesis, okay? Nobody's saying they're never around, but there was a time when society, when our country saw them for what they were and they put them in their place six feet under. And unfortunately, we have forgotten that in our country. I sit here every day of my life, every day of my life, listening to Greg Locke and Tommy McMurtry, Stephen Anderson, Kent Hovind, Kenneth Copeland, Donald Trump, all of these other political and religious figures saying things like that every single day. I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, Greg Locke, and his people, his congregants, his friends, his fellow pastors are on the exact same timeline, on the exact same side as Nazi Germany was in the 1930s. Have we reached the Jew hunt phase? No. No, we haven't reached that stage yet. But we are moving along that timeline right now. Now, I don't care if you don't like that comparison, if you feel like it's unfair, whatever else. I don't care. That's what it is. You have no idea how many books I have read about denazification and the timeline of events and how people arrived at these conclusions that they did psychologically and the psychological damage that it did to everybody involved. 
You have no idea how many books I've read about this. I'm saying without a shadow of a doubt, Greg Locke would be on the side of the Nazis in 1930s Germany. So let's continue reading the book here where Greg Locke is telling us that he would have been on the other side of the battle. Whatever you think you would have been doing then is exactly what you aren't doing right now. Or we can put it this way. If you aren't doing it now, you, would have do- you wouldn't have done it then. It's easy to talk about what we would have done a long time ago in a situation we'll never have to face. We are facing it right now. We are actually facing it right now. The LGBT community and many other minority groups are being treated the same way the Jews were being treated in 1930s Germany, early 30s Germany, early to mid 30s. I'd say we're in 1935 on the timeline right now. Seriously, I'm not joking or being hyperbolic. Matter of fact, you know what? Just to really drive this point home, let me see if I can find something specific here. Um, We can't watch this whole thing, but let me just show you this, this video from when when is this from 1947 to yeah this is a a series of educational films from 1942 to 1947 and it was an attempt to prevent americans from falling for what the germans fell for in nazi germany it's it's intended to prevent americans from going down the nazi germany route watch this They can live together and work together and build America together because they're free. Free to vote, to say what they please, go to their own churches, to pick their own jobs. Yeah, Mike's got something, all right. He's got America. But there are guys who stay up nights figuring out how to take that away from him. I want to give you the truth, folks. The truth about America. I know you've got a lot of questions. You want to know why you're not getting the breaks you deserve? Well, I'm not a politician, but I've made it my business to study these things, and I happen to know the facts. Now, friends, I'm just an average American. But I'm an American American, and some of the things I see in this country of ours make my blood boil. I see people with foreign accents making all the money. I see Negroes holding jobs that belong to me and you. Now I ask you, if we allow this thing to go on, what's going to become of us real Americans? Notice how they're segregating people into real Americans and fake Americans, people who deserve a good life and people who don't. This is the exact thing that happened in Nazi Germany, and that that is the exact reason why this film was made to point out that distinction to make people realize what's happening is wrong and leads to something truly deeply devastating to society that's why they're making that comparison that's why they're pointing it out in the first place i've heard this kind of talk before but i never expected to hear it in america it says i've heard this kind of talk before never expected to hear it here in america well, it seems to know what he's talking about. Yes, he knows all right. What's the answer? What are we real Americans going to do about it? You'll find it right here in this little pamphlet. The truth about Negroes and foreigners. The truth about the Catholic Church. Now, friends, these books are free. Paid for by real Americans who want others to know the truth. Excuse me, young man, but are you actually going to read that stuff? Sure, why not? You heard what he said, didn't you? Yes, I heard. Do you believe in that kind of talk? I don't know. It makes pretty good sense to me. I'm speaking to you as an American American. And I tell you, friends, we'll never be able to call this country our own until it's a country without. Without what? Yeah, without what? Without Negroes. Without alien foreigners. Without Catholics. Without Freemasons. What's wrong with the Masons? I'm a Mason. Hey, that fellow's talking about me. And that makes a difference, doesn't it? These are your enemies. These are the people who are trying to take over our country. Now you know them. 
You know what they stand for. And it's up to you and me to fight them. Fight them and destroy them before they destroy us. Do you remember the speech Donald Trump gave at the very beginning of his campaign 2016? They're not sending their best. What was it he said? They're bringing crime, they're so on and so forth. Does that sound familiar? Thank you. Before he said Mason, you were ready to agree with him. Well, yes, but he was talking about, well, about those other people. But in this country, we have no other people. We are American people, all of us. What about you? You aren't American, are you? I was born in Hungary, but now I am an American citizen. And I have seen what this kind of talk can do. I saw it in Berlin. What were you doing there? I was a professor at the university. I heard the same words we have heard today. But I was a fool then. I thought Nazis were crazy people, stupid fanatics. But unfortunately, it was not so. Well, they were crazy people. They were stupid fanatics. That, that is so. It's just they captured the psyche of everybody around them. They sucked them into an ideology and made that ideology appealing to others by demonizing their enemies, by demonizing the people that they hate. Is this sounding familiar? They knew that they were not strong enough to conquer a unified country. So they split Germany into small groups. They used prejudice as a practical weapon to cripple the nation. Of course, that was not easy to do. They had to work hard to do it. You see, we human beings are not born with prejudices. Always they are made for us made by someone who wants something. Remember that when you hear this kind of talk. We aren't born with prejudices. They're made by somebody who wants something. That's interesting, right? We are born with a tendency to favor the tribe that we're from, but bigotry and hatred and prejudice comes from people who want to teach it. Somebody is going to get something out of it, and it isn't going to be you. This is not classroom theory. I saw it happen. I saw it first in Berlin in 1932. 1932 was the start of the whole ugly mess. Uh, by 1935, they, I believe they'd already shuttled Jews into ghettos and demonized them terribly. And there was a plague, I think, what, typhoid? I, maybe it was typhoid that was being passed around uh, the ghettos in Germany at the time, and they used that as a pretext to basically ban Jews from exiting the ghettos at all. And if they did exit the ghettos, the areas that they had cordoned off, then they would be killed. Five young men that I knew were standing in the crowd listening to the Nazi speaker. Eric was a Catholic. Anton, a student of mine, was a Jew. Heinrich owned a small hardware store. Carl was a farmer, and Hans was an unemployed metal worker. To all true Aryan Germans, I say it is time you inherited the nation which rightfully belongs to you. To you alone belongs the glorious destiny of the greater Germany. The Nazi party will provide land for the farmer, work for the worker, and profits for the small businessmen. The Nazi party was tiny. It was a, a tiny little itty-bitty party that nobody paid attention to, like the America First Party or whatever. It was just a little thing that nobody listened to, and they thought they were nutbags. And they were nutbags. But they won political power, won victory after another, until they got to a point where they had a platform big enough that they could broadcast their message far and wide to a disproportionate number of people. And suddenly, everybody is listening. Everybody knows about the message. And the message is, these people are your enemies. These people are the reason why you're suffering. These people are the reason why you don't have everything that you ever wanted, a mansion and a nice car and, and all that other stuff. That was their message. Divide and conquer. And, and it worked in Nazi Germany. It worked. They succeeded. Who is getting these things now? The Jew. The Jew who has stolen our nation and our birthright. Who makes all the money and takes all our jobs? The Jew! He must be shunned! 
He must be ostracized. He must be eliminated. And the Catholics. We don't want our great nation run by a foreign church. We Germans will know what to do with these people when the time comes. They and their faith must be destroyed. Then there are the Freemasons. In Germany, we have no place for secret societies. There may be only one society, and that is the Nazi party. There may be no secrecy about that in the new greater Germany. One by one, he attacked each minority and he split them off one from the other. These men were all fellow Germans when they came here today. Now they were split into rival groups, suspicious of each other, hating each other. They were being swindled, all of them. But the man who was really being fooled was Hans. He was pure German, according to Nazi standards. To him, they promised everything, and he fell for it. You who are true Aryan Germans will share the glorious destiny of our fatherland. You are the pure-blooded, the master race. It is your divine right to rule, and the Nazi party stands ready to put you into power. It is for you to command all Germany, and someday, the entire world! You see how it can be appealing to be told that you are the best of the best and you deserve this thing or that. You deserve to be rich. And the fact that you're not is the fault of this group over here. And if we just deal with this group, if we just stop this from happening, you will be rich. We will make sure of it. You see how that can be appealing? I mean, naturally, it's probably not appealing to the type of people who watch my channel because you recognize it for what it is, a grift. But to any other person out there who is unaware of history or unaware of how this works you can see why this would rope people in and, and be interesting to them right that's how hans became a superman they gave him a uniform and they pumped up his ego he wasn't just a little fellow out of work anymore he was a member of the master race his wife couldn't quite understand even though he was a superman there wasn't any food in the house. Stupid woman. Didn't she realize that the Nazis were going to make jobs for everybody? There would be plenty of food and clothing and a new house. Everything they wanted. The glorious future of Germany was to be theirs. And their children would someday rule the world. But his wife, silly woman, still wondered where the next meal was coming from. Hans didn't like that kind of talk. It was dangerous. For that kind of talk, people should be put in jail. Hans had swallowed the bait all right. And these were the men who baited the hook. Why? Is Joseph Goebbels in the background, I believe. Uh, that was Hitler's propaganda minister, and he came up with a bunch of propaganda techniques, like the big lie, for example, stuff like that. So that Hans could come to power? Of course not. So they could come to power. They would merely use Hans to help them get there. He would do the dirty work for them. After Hitler died, or after he killed himself, Joseph Goebbels, I believe, was chancellor of Germany for a single day, and then he killed himself the exact same way Hitler did. Hans and thousands of others like him, all playing a sucker's game. They gambled with other people's liberty, and of course, they lost their own. A nation of suckers. Hitler needed these people. There was lots of work to be done. There were trade unions to be smashed, because unions were organized and might offer resistance. There were many political parties in Germany. These the Nazis destroyed. They were determined to smash every organization where people might band together and resist them. There were Jews to be beaten and killed. The Jews were not powerful, but they were a convenient excuse for all the nation's ills. And besides, a Nazi party member could not take over this man's stall. And how did they manage to blame Jews when the, the Jews were obviously not in any sort of political power position in the country? 
they claimed that international Jews ran international banks and stuff like that. They owned a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, these Jews are lowly and live in the ghettos and, and have no political power, but their cousins and their uncles and their aunts and stuff who they listen to, they control all the big banks and they are the heart of all of the problems of the country. That's how they framed it and that's how they managed to blame this one minority group, despite the fact that they had absolutely no political power of any sort and were very obviously being persecuted terribly. They were the cabal from that time. Yeah, they were. They were. They were absolutely the cabal, the, the deep state. They were the Illuminati at the time, the Jews were, and honestly still are. But I think the Illuminati, the cabal, or the deep state has focused less on Jewish ancestry and more on i mean in in america at least and more on like democrats and the lgbt community and stuff now it's focused more on the political entities that the modern day republican party hates which does include jews it's just they focus on jews less now than they did back then obviously People have been doing this for a long time. This is a method that's existed since the dawn of time. Not only has this method existed since the dawn of time, but we can watch it play out in real time today, right now, among Greg Locke and his fans, his congregants, his friends, his fellow pastors. He uses this exact strategy that we just watched on this 1942 video. I'm to the place right now, if you vote Democrat, I don't even want you around this church. You can get out. You can get out, you demon. You can get out, you baby butchering election thief. Notice he's accusing the Democrats of various different things, being demons, being election thieves. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. I don't care how mad that makes you. You get pissed off as you want to. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. They are God-denying demons that butcher babies and hate this nation. Or how about this one right here? This is another one he, he put out not too long ago. This one is from uh, April, mid-April 2022. We have to stop compromising to the propaganda. So I say this and we volley back. One of the things we did to push back against the nonsense is not only put up the sign, but we told our folks we so believe. Put up the sign, no masks allowed on this church campus. So believe in our First Amendment right to gather under this tent and to worship Jesus Christ. That if you show up with your propaganda machine and you try to impede on our First Amendment right, I said our boys will meet you at the door of this tent with our Second Amendment right because we're not playing your Democrat games. This is a church and we're going to stand. So the point is Greg Locke is on the side that the Nazis were on.